Welcome to Purim at Hamakom. And you might be wondering why I have sparkly glasses on. I'll take them off for a second so you know it's really me. I'm Rabbi Ruth Adar, and I'm here to tell you about the holiday of Purim. This is Purim 101, and it's time for our annual celebration that comes just as we are tired of darkness and winter and all of that stuff. And possibly at certain points in our history, we're tired of the czar or tired of whoever it is that's been beating up on the Jews lately. So we gather and we put on our funny masks and costumes. Now it's all centered around the book of Ruth, the Megillot, excuse me, the book of Esther, Megillot Esther, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. And uh, so we've got characters from that and sometimes we dress as them. So I'm gonna show you some of my Purim wardrobe here. This is a mask. It, you know, now you can't tell who the heck I am um, because on Purim in the book of Esther, there's masking and unmasking. So we put on masks for Purim to imitate the book. Um, there are good guys in, in uh, the book of Esther. For instance, there is, Queen Esther, who wears a beautiful outfit like so. It's never too late to have a Jewish childhood, by the way. Um, now I'm Esther, and I can wear my crown and tell the story of Esther. There's a bad guy, and whenever we say his name, everybody makes a racket or says, boo. So... Here I am as Haman, boo. Um, or uh, it turns out that through the magic of technology, here is a different Haman hat, which I kind of like. Um, that's part of what we do for Pura. Now we, we are supposed to feast, to celebrate all of the times that we have been delivered from terrible danger. Um, sometimes with the help of God and miracles, and sometimes through our own um, machinations. But the Jewish people have hung around all these years. And so partly we're celebrating that. And in a good year, that's really what's going on, is we are celebrating the fact that we aren't dead yet. Um, and it becomes kind of a children's holiday, and that's lovely. Oh, I like the I like the lights. Thank you, whoever did that. And uh, when it's when it's not when we're having um, a bad year, then we remember we are reminded by Purim and by the Book of Esther. We're reminded that things are not so bad. That if we're smart, if we're willing to pay the price involved, we can survive. Um, now, another thing we do is we read the Megillot Esther. This is, uh, this is a copy of a Megillot Esther. This is not a Torah. And I'll hold it up so you can see it. It's a beautiful, beautiful document. Um, it's the one scroll that can sometimes be illustrated, which is very, very cool. Um, there is also, I don't really have a good costume for him. I'll use the Haman costume again. There is also a very foolish ruler named Ahasuerus or Ahasuerus, depending on whether you speak Hebrew or Greek. And he is, he is really, he is an idiot. Um, that's actually, that's, that's ableist. He is a fool. Uh, he drinks and he makes a fool of himself and he, throws his power around very carelessly and uh, bad things come of it. So there are lessons to be learned. Um, so it's time to put on our funny masks and costumes. I would encourage any of you who have, uh, who want to play with your filters, feel free to show up as a cat or a bunny, uh, especially if somebody's got that cat filter, by, by golly, use it. Um, but but I invite you to, to enjoy Esther because this is the time when Jews turn our world upside down. There's a Hebrew word I'd like for you to learn, which is called hafuch. Can you say hafuch? You don't have to unmute. You can just say it in your house. Hafuch means 
upside down. And it can be literally upside down. Uh, sometimes, you know, you could have acrobats. Uh, I do not do this often, hanging upside down, so I'm going to come back around. Um, but we do, we're silly. Um, in medieval synagogues, sometimes they would put the, the, the gabai, the, the, essentially the, the, the janitor, uh, the person who took care of the synagogue, would be put in the rabbi's chair for the day and given all the rabbi's uh, special clothes and, and all of that. And the rabbi would be the janitor. Um, in some places, there was cross-dressing. Uh, until really about 10 years ago, the uh, Temple Sinai here in Oakland had a whole uh, Rabbi Steve Chester would put on a ball ground and be Esther Chester. And it was truly amazing. Um, but all of it centers on the book of Esther. And uh, we chant the scroll with a special hafuch upside down trope. So I'm going to do just a little bit of it so that you get a chance to see it. Um, when I raise, let's see, I don't want to raise a glass to it. Uh, when I raise this bottle of sparkling water, you will know that I'm singing the name of the bad guy. And I want you to just boo or make whatever kind of racket you can make, okay? Ah, <laughs> Et Haman ben Hamidata Hagagiv Yena Sehu. Okay, that gives you a little taste. If you're musically inclined and you look at the trope, it's the Shabbat trope turned upside down. And uh, that makes it either easier to learn or harder to learn, depending. My brain kind of runs backwards, so Esther trope was easy for me to learn. Um, okay, so let's see. I'd like to know, now that we've had a chance to settle in and I've been sufficiently alarming, um, I'd like to know, just type in the box if you have, what your associations for Purim are. What things about Purim, you can put in the chat box, the things that you think of when you hear that Purim is coming. Purim Carnival, yes. Costumes, yes. Face painting. Loud noises and treats. Hamantashen. Hamantashen. Haman. And singular cookies or actually they're funny cookies with filling and they're wonderful. Uh, cookies, yes, cookies. Cookies make for a good holiday. And good songs about three corners, yes, yes. All of those are, are great associations for a really, truly strange day. It's a strange holiday. Some people talk about it as the Jewish Mardi Gras, which I think sort of works, except that, of course, um, it's also for children. Mardi Gras is not really for kids, but, but Purim really is. And sometimes you will have adult holidays, adult celebrations of Purim, where um, there is, is a liquid celebration that goes on. And although the, we also, in our Purim literature, it, it cautions us not to get too crazy with that stuff. Um, but that's, that is Purim. Um, and yes, the silliness, uh, the costumes, the celebration are very important. That's what's familiar to most of us about Purim because we've, we have been living through a period of history, at least here in the United States, where we've been relatively privileged. The Jewish people have been relatively safe. When uh, at other times, one of the things that Purim has done for us, I mentioned the czar a little while ago, um, the deal with the czar is that, oh, I see what I did. I did that light thing. Okay. Anyway, in the pale of the settlement, we, there were Ashkenazi Jews who lived in great fear and great suffering 
because they never knew when the Cossacks were going to be sent through or just the or just the Goyesha neighbors were going to come through and and really do damage to everyone. And so we had this ingenious little holiday where we could go, we could chant from a scroll that our neighbors couldn't understand. And when we heard Haman, there you go, make racket again. We we might know that what we're drowning out is the name of Haman. But what we were also doing is getting out all of our anger at the czar. I learned this on my first Purim. Uh, my first Purim was when I was an adult, which is why I like to say never too late for a Jewish childhood. I went to a Purim celebration. It was a, it was a chanting of the, of the Megillah, of the scroll. And I happened to sit in a row, it was 20 years ago, with some Holocaust survivors. A lovely, a lovely uh, Sephardic couple. And these were the sweetest, mildest people I had ever met. And I saw a whole new side of them during the reading of the Megillah. They were just about it. And I could tell that there was a kind of a, they, they were really getting out anger and, and suffering and pushing it out of themselves. This is something, it's a really genius thing the Jewish people have done. So in bad times or when we have been through bad times, it serves us really well. And now when we're living through a time where we wear masks like this and masks like this, it's nice to be able to supplement them. I can't do this, but I'll, I'll do the best I can with masks like this so that it's a different sort of a thing. Um, what I think would be really fun to do as a home activity, I don't have my, my, uh, my mask, I think it's in the car. Anyway, you can put, you, you can get a regular mask and decorate your mask for Purim and, and have, uh, do all the crazy things with that um, because that, that will give you um, a way to celebrate that's just for this year. And that kind of says to that stupid virus, we are really sick of you, not sick with COVID, but sick with fed upness at, um, at this ridiculous thing that we've been going through. So anybody got questions about Purim? about the celebration, about the story? Does everybody know the story of Esther or would you like to hear the 60 second version <laughs> of the book of Esther? Okay, I'm not seeing any questions. So I'll tell you a little about Esther. Okay, Esther takes place in the kingdom of Persia and Jews have been living in Persia for a very long time. We know for a fact that the writers of the book of Esther knew that they were not really writing a history. And the reason we know that is that they knew a lot about the Persian court. The archeologists and other um, and, and, and historians have actually studied the book of Esther to learn what, what the court, learn about Persian court customs. Things like massive drinking parties, which were a big part of Persian culture. And, um, and a fascination with, with great riches. But so there's, it's knowledgeable about the Persians, but at the same time, there's some big strange things in that book. One of the biggest is Esther herself. Persian kings or, or the, the Persian kings married their cousins. They did not marry out of the family, much less out of the culture. And so already that tells us, because we have a Queen Esther in the book, that something's a little funny about this story. It's intended to teach us a lesson. The rabbis were so determined that we would learn this lesson that in if you go to, to, to the Talmud to tractate Megillah, tractate scrolls, which is all about, starts out being all about Esther. Um, they say, okay, you should read the book on the 14th of Adar 
However, if you don't read it on the 14th of Adar, read it on the 15th of Adar. If you can't read it on the 15th of Adar, read it on the 17th or the 15th, or just heck, read it. They're really insistent that we read this book. And that's because in some ways it is both a survival manual and a cautionary tale about living in Galut, living outside the land of Israel, living in a place that we do not control, uh, that is not a Jewish place. The Jews in the book of Esther are a very assimilated bunch. We can see Mordecai has no problem. In fact, he hopes that his niece will be picked by the king. So I'm getting a little ahead of myself. We begin in the capital of Shushan. And in Shushan, the king called his wife Vashti. Here's my Vashti costume. He called Vashti and he said, I've been having a drinking party with my male buddies for, for like a week and we are wasted. And now Vashti, we want you to come and dance for us. Vashti was a very modest woman, by the way, but they wanted Vashti to come in and dance in nothing but her jewels. And Vashti said, you are out of your mind. No way am I going to do that. And so he says, oh, well, what am I going to do about that? And his advisor, Memukon, said, who's a code actually for, for Haman, says, you know what? If you don't get rid of that wife, all of our wives are going to start acting like that. And so the king says, okay, off with her head or something. We don't really know what happened to Vashti, except that he divorced her and banished her. And we don't see her in the kingdom anymore, ever really, really mean stuff. So by the way, there's going to be a class about Vashti. If you want to hear about the things that might have happened to Vashti and the wonderful stories about Vashti, I'll give you that information at the end of this, or you can get it on the website. But uh, our, our educators have a fabulous program planned. But at any rate, the king, now the king goes, but I'm lonesome. I need to have a queen around. I don't like being single. And his advisors say, fine, have a beauty contest. Pick yourself out a nice girl. And so he sends out the word, all the pretty girls in Persia are going to come and he's going to meet them and entertain them and they're going to entertain him and he's going to pick a new wife. Well, when Esther, who was a nice Jewish girl, heard about this, she said, mm, I don't think so. But her uncle Mordechai said, you know, this could be a good thing for the Jews. Why don't you go and see, try your luck? And don't tell him you're a Jew, because that might be a problem. This, again, tells us something about life in Galut. It wasn't entirely safe to be labeled a Jew. So she goes, and lo and behold, she's the one that the king picks. And the king is... Just, he is just enraptured with his new wife. He just loves her. She's the prettiest and she gets all of Vashti's jewels and more jewels and more goodies. And uh, fortunately he doesn't ask her to dance naked. So that's good. <sighs> then evil Haman, rrr, then evil Haman goes to the king and he says to the king, did you know that there is a certain people in your land who don't follow your rules at all. And they're very rowdy and they're a big problem and you need to get rid of them. But you know what, King, I'll get rid of them for you because I hate them. And the King says, Oh, I don't know. That could be expensive. And came and says, I'll even pay for it. Well, the King takes his ring off his finger. There's lots of jewelry in this story too. Takes his ring off his finger and he says, here, take this and set it all up. When you have that ring, everybody has to do what you say. So Haman went and he cast poor, which is like dice, to figure out what was the auspicious day to kill all the Jews. Kind of hard to imagine that that would be an auspicious day, but he's looking for that. 
and Haman sets the date and he puts out posters saying on the 14th of Adar, kill all the Jews you want, everybody. Well, that's just terrible news. Mordecai, Uncle Mordecai, sends a letter to Queen Esther and he says, Esther, honey, I think this is the moment you were born for. Get the king to call this thing off. And so she goes through, it's too, it's too involved to get into here, but Esther manages not only to save the Jewish people, she manages to, to inveigle, to, 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 to make Haman look so bad in the eyes of the king. Because here he was wanting to kill off the, the king's new wife that he loves. And so the king had Haman killed. And he called on Mordecai to help him figure out what to do about the about the um, about the massacre. Because remember, he couldn't take his ring back. But Mordecai said, "Arm the Jews, let them defend themselves." Now that's the sad part of the Book of Esther. At the end, there's a terrible price to pay because there is a massacre, but it's of Persians. Apparently, Jews in those days were really good fighters. But at the end of the story, there are a whole bunch of people who say, yeah, I want to be Jewish. No kidding. And um, and a rule that's set down by Queen Esther that we will celebrate this holiday forever and ever. Now, what we learn, I don't know. What do you think we learned from that story? Anybody got any ideas? You can put them in the chat box. What do you think is a lesson we learned from the story of Esther? I think one lesson is that we learned that we can defend ourselves when we have to. We don't have to wait for miracles. Another story, uh, another thing we learned from it is that when we get so deep into a mess that we have to do that, sometimes there's a price to pay. Sometimes it's not the way you'd really like it to turn out. And here Tamar says, sometimes we need to go undercover. And then there are times we need to take off our masks. And Jody says, it takes a woman to fix the worst messes. I like that one. And Eric says, to be true to who you are and that we are stronger than we think. I like that one too. Purim is about removing our masks, putting on our masks when we need to do that taking off our masks. I'd like to finish with one thought that there's a holiday on the other side of the year. If you drew a line across the Jewish year, it would almost run right into another day. And that day is Yom Kippur. Now, Purim is a holiday about wearing masks. Me, yay. About wearing masks. Yom Kippur is a day being on of our disguises and just being who we are. And I love that they're on opposite sides of the Jewish year. They're a balance. Sometimes we need to do the one, we need to wear masks. And sometimes it's really important to be exactly who we are, warts and all. Uh, so the, the filters that make us look nice or the little goodies, the costumes we might want to put on, you know, those are, are nice. But they can also be misused and they can get stuck on us. We can find that we can't get out of our, our masks. Um, so our tradition has this wonderful balance in it. And I would just leave you with that thought. <laughs>